Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. I'm your host, Philip Van Dusen, and I am excited because I'm here today with Kathy Onetto. Kathy is an executive coach, career strategist, and brand strategy professional and the owner of a brand consultancy called the Agency Onetto. Kathy's also the founder of Sustainable Ambition, a brand focused on creating a fulfilling career that offers a sense of ease in your professional and personal life while still being ambitious. Now, full disclosure, Kathy and I previously worked together at co- as colleagues on a global branding agency in San Francisco, building brands for dozens of Fortune 500 clients, and have also, in recent years, partnered on projects together from my agency, Erhal Brand Design. So, we have a bit of history with each other, and we both know where all the bodies are buried, so this should be a fun conversation. And with that, I w- welcome Kathy. Yes, thank you for having me, Philip. I just want to say, actually, Philip is really one of my favorite people, if not my f- most favorite person. Yeah, he's rolling his eyes. Um, for those who are listening to this, to partner with on brand strategy and branding projects, um, he is my go-to. That's very nice of you to say. And Kathy is obviously my go-to strategist. Um, and taught me a lot about what I know about strategy. I've learned from Kathy. So hats off to you, too. Um so tell me a little bit about sustainable ambition. What is sustainable ambition? Yeah, well, as you noted, the way that I define sustainable ambition is that it's about creating and crafting a fulfilling career to support your life from decade to decade. And that's really with an end goal of creating more fulfillment in your professional and personal life uh, with more ease while still being ambitious. And it really started as more of like a media platform. You know, I've been Mm. writing about this topic for about five years or so. It's, you know, even though I don't believe in following your passion, I will say this has been a passion project of mine. It's something that has held my attention, frankly, since I was 15 years old and first going through a college catalog and trying to figure out what what, what I should major in, as if like circling, uh, you know, majors in a college book is going to help me figure out what I should do with my life. Um, But it's held my attention all of my career, this notion of really thinking about one's career um, and what I should do next. It's kind of been my touchstone as I've gone through my life, a question as I come to transition points. And so uh, I've thought about this a lot um, over time. I even did as I was in business school, like a career transition workshop. I've worked with coaches across the course of my career. And it has culminated in this platform that I now started called Sustainable Ambition. And as I said, I have a lot of writing and tools on the topic that I offer on the website. And then I also offer one-on-one coaching, workshops, and VIP sessions as well. So would you say that Sustainable Ambition as a brand and as an offering was really influenced by your own journey? And are you bringing aspects of what your learning was through that journey to to what you do with a sustainable ambition? Absolutely, yes. Um, it's interesting because as I started to write on this more and started to look back through my own career, I realized I've actually been living sustainable ambition throughout my career. So just as an example of that, when I first left college and went to live in New York City, I was a 21 year old who decided not to take a consulting or investment banking gig because I didn't want to work 60 to 80 hours a week. Now, I probably worked 50 to 60 hours per week. I still am a hard worker, but I actually wanted to experience New York City. And also, this is so crazy that I thought this because I was going to live in New York City, but I grew up as an athlete and I wanted to do triathlons <laughs> in, New- in New York City, from New York City. Um, and I did that, by, way, by the way, um, wow. <laughs> from New York City. And But that's how I, I made that choice in that moment. Or like making a choice to go to business school at Berkeley, um, that was a conscious decision. I didn't apply to certain business schools because I didn't want to be in certain cultural environments and nothing against <laughs> those business schools. It was just my own personal fit for myself where, you know, Berkeley is now termed this as one of their values, this idea of confidence without attitude. I really wanted to be around 
people that kind of had a certain value set and Berkeley was um, had a culture that was felt like a fit for me. And so as I think back on my own career, I've I've made these kind of decisions that align with some of the philosophies that I've put in place around sustainable ambition. And then, yes, some of the things that I'm even been living through or going through over the last several years, even as I've gone out as a solo pluspreneur, I'm I'm bringing some of that insight into sustainable ambition. So let me just mention one other thing around that, Philip, because um, I, I, now I'm getting nervous because I've started to say this on my own podcast and now I'm going to say it here. Like, shh, everyone, I took a sabbatical. Uh, now, so like there's, I have um, a guide on my website, Sustainable Ambition, that talks about how to sabbatical. You know, that's not something that is common. It still, to me, feels like it's kind of a taboo in the mm. corporate world. Uh, and so those are the types of things that, yes, from my own experience, I'm also bringing into some of what I offer on Sustainable Ambition. So, I mean, from what I know, sabbatical can sometimes be code for I'm out of work right now. And so that could be some of that taboo around it because that's what people think sometimes when they hear it. But I think that there is there is incredible value in doing that to be able to kind of back up and reconsider what you're doing and what your passion is. And so when you took your sabbatical, was it between things or was that intentionally to kind of, kind of let the dust settle and figure out what was really important to you? So I had wanted to take a sabbatical for probably five years before I did it. And part of the reason why it's, I remember distinctly having a conversation with a friend where I said, I really just feel like I need to take a break. And part of that was because, you know, I've actually started to ID this in people as I've been coaching more recently, where it seems like there are some of us that kind of need a steady state. And then there are some of us that like, when we get into something, we're all in. And then it's kind of like we need bigger chunks to recharge. And so I'm one of those type of people. I'm a highly committed, <laughs> highly dedicated worker and somebody that gives her all. And so not, in, not surprisingly, I got to a point where I felt like I really needed a break. But I also had a job opportunity come up. And my husband also ended up deciding to take a break. So I took that job opportunity and, you know, I had to wait until I was able to take that break. So there was a desire for me to do it. And then I actually got quite lucky because I'm also very fiscally responsible. And I would advise that anybody who is going to take a sabbatical be fiscally responsible. And so we planned for it. And then I got lucky in that where I was working, they were like, we don't really want to lose you. <laughs> Would you like fine, go and take your seven and a half months off, but will you come back and then help us through this period of time? Uh, and then, you know, you can go on and do what you want to do next. And so it really gave me, it was a planned break. It's very strategic and thoughtful and also thought through in terms of kind of financially, as well as from a job perspective, how do I land? What am I going to do after that, et cetera? Not to say that the landing is always easy and that it doesn't take some working through, um, but that's how it kind of took shape for me. So when you, you've had and been a brand consultant and strategist um, on your own for a while with the agency Onetto, and now you have dialed in this, um, the, the executive coaching and the career aspect of it. Kind of what would you say brought that on? What was, what was, that, what was that pivot from doing mostly brand consulting? And are you gonna give that up or are you going to kind of focus entirely on, on, on coaching or are you gonna find that mix that's happy for you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that this is, you know, it relates a bit to sustainable ambition, which is my belief. Again, there are a lot of societal kind of pressures or these supposed norms that are out there around who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to show up from mm. a work kind of perspective. And I think everyone wants us to be one note. You know, and I get it, Philip. You know me. I can complicate things. I'm overly thorough. But I also think 
many of us are not one note. We have a lot of aspects to ourselves. We have a lot of different interests. And so for me, this is actually something I'm still working through, just honestly. And so I'm definitely still doing strategy work. And I think of my first myself first as a strategist. And I do, you know, business strategy, brand strategy, marketing strategy, et cetera. Um, and I still see myself doing that work and complementing it with the coaching. Um, but I'm still in process on this. And I think this is something, you know, I don't know if you want to go here, but this is something I've been thinking about of late because as we build our businesses, you know, sometimes you think you know exactly where it's going. And I think I'm at even this pivot point where I'm like, okay, I need to pause for a second and actually see like, how are these businesses going to coexist together? Where are those complementary points? You know, what's important to the marketplace and where do I fit in? You know, and then what, what also brings me joy? What, you know, what makes me happy about my work? And I think that's a really important aspect to bring into these types of conversations too, as we're building, you know, these, these different aspects of our businesses out. I think that's a really, really great point. I did a video a while back that asked the question, are you a multi-creative? And it was really popular, like it kind of blew me away. And I asked in the video for people to share their stories of being multi-creative in the comments. And the comments are the longest that I think I've ever gotten for a video. And it was really intriguing for me because there are so many creative people who have multiple streams of creativity and it causes them an incredible, from what I'm reading, an incredible amount of angst and discomfort in trying to find that balance between their multiple outlets. Some people, you know, err on the side of being so multi-creative that they can't find one to focus on, to leverage, to make a, a living on. And so it ends up being more torture than pleasure. And others um, just find that their streams are so disparate that they have a hard time kind of reconciling them in their own head. Um, and so it sounds like there's a bit, there's a bit of that with you. And I, to tell you the truth, I've kind of been going through it too in terms of my agency and then my own personal brand and teaching through brand design masters, finding that balance between, you know, my community and the people I serve there and then my branding clients. Um, I do think they in inform both. Wouldn't you say that they kind of, they do? I absolutely think they do. And I've also had people tell me like, look, you would actually wouldn't be as interesting to me, or I wouldn't be as interested in working with you as a coach if you weren't doing the strategy work mm. as well. I mean, I do think that there's something to like keeping your foot in the door of industry or keeping, you know, and being familiar with what's happening within organizations and, and companies. And I, I can be quite theoretical. And so uh, I think it's also helpful for me to keep some tie to that practicality, right, in the application uh, within organizations as well. I think it's also helpful from a coach perspective, like, you know, an individual operates within an organization, right? And you have to kind of understand, I don't know, you know, from a coach training, they're kind of like, got. it's about the person and coaching them for their life. And it, you don't have to understand their world completely. And I think that's partly true. You know, you are coaching the individual. They need to be an expert in their life. But, you know, for executive coaching or for some of the other types of coaching that I do, I think that that context actually really does, having that context really does help. So let's pivot a little bit to talking about building your brand. When you you started uh, Agency Onetto and then you kind of you developed, I know, a newsletter and found a voice there. But then as you've now built, you're starting to build sustainable ambition, you now have two kind of brand streams going there. Can you talk a little bit about how you developed your own digital entrepreneur brand? How did you go about becoming visible? This is a really good question. And, you know, I will see if we get here. I This is not the easiest thing, you know, in some respects. And yet, and I'm a brand strategist. So, because one of the things I just, as we've already said, right? But the reason I'm punctuating that <laughs> is to say for even somebody that knows branding, sometimes starting to build your own brand and navigating through your journey can get messy and you can have to revisit it and kind of come back and, and readjust things. So, you know, with Sustainable Ambition, you know, I launched it last year 
but it was off of four prior years of writing under a different name. And I decided to rebrand it all of what I had been doing around this career writing and what's have you. And I decided to rebrand it under this idea of sustainable ambition. And that came up out of an ideation that happened early last year. It seemed to be really sticky. It like had an association with all of my prior work. And, you know, as part of a business community that I'm a part of, I was encouraged, like, I felt like this was sustainable ambition was a term that like, I'm like, I got to get it out there because I want to own this and I want to own this platform and I want to trademark it. Well, then it's kind of like, okay, well get it out there as quickly as possible. Okay. Well, guess what? You think that that's just, I'll write a quick article, throw it up on LinkedIn. And I could have done that, but it took me a, it took me a little while to like, well, what really is this idea? And let me frame it and create the structure around it. And then I started to realize as I went to go rebrand my website, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me launching my coaching practice. Oh my gosh, this is a bigger project than I realized. And so all of a sudden I'm building, rebuilding my website. And I will say again, I'm a solopreneur. I also, solo pluspreneur, but I also like getting my hands dirty and like getting into things. And so how did I build this? Well, first off, I built a website and I built it myself and I built it on Squarespace and I used the videos that are out there and got myself to do that. Um, I like to write. So content is my core thing and how I'm thinking about really building my brand. And I kind of buy into Dory Clark's uh, philosophy around becoming a recognized expert. So I believe in creating your own content and leaning into that and putting it out into the world. Uh, where I want to emphasize more going forward is really around what she calls social proof and getting more, you know, PR and pub getting into publications and what have you, uh, as well as networking. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the things that I've done, so it's like, I, I have this platform, I got, I built the website, got content, started to publish content. I have a newsletter. I have, um, you know, I'm posting on LinkedIn, which is, I'm not a big social person. So LinkedIn is my core uh, social platform. And it makes sense, luckily for me, for the type of coaching I'm doing. Um, but then what I also did recently, and you were kindly on, is I launched, I decided to launch a podcast. And so that is yet another form of content that I am leveraging for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, there were a lot of different reasons I launched the podcast, but let me pause there because I well, can. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk about the reasons. Why, why did you, no, I mean, writing felt natural. You started with writing and developing content in your newsletter, which is amazing, by the way, if anyone needs to subscribe to an incredible newsletter. And um, the link will be in the description. Uh, the And then you move to the podcast. The podcast, um, what did you, why did you go to that then, you know, much more kind of, I guess, public or, or type of medium? And what were you, what were you hoping to do there? Yeah. It serves a number of different purposes for me. So one is obviously it's content. Two is I see it as research for myself, right? Mm. I get to talk to people and learn and hear what they have to say. And for them to share their stories with me is amazing, as well as their expertise, because I talk with experts, authors, and friends. You check a couple of those boxes, uh, which is why I had you on. And, you know, so so it's, it's content, it's research, and then it's also in this space, you know, I hope I don't, people who listen to this won't be like, oh my gosh, that's why she had me on. But it's like <laughs> one of the things that Dory Clark said, it says is also you need to network, right? And this is a new space for me, okay? So stepping into this world, I am creating my second career, right? Around the space and creating expertise around career management and this overall space, which I think is really important in the future of work of, what is sustainable ambition? And I just don't think we think about this realistically enough in our world right now. And so for me, 
the other th way that the, the podcast really serves is around networking and starting to give me a reason to get introduced to and to be in conversation with mm. people who are operating in this space. And so, um, and then the final thing is I really enjoy it. It's, I really enjoy being in conversation. And this is an insight that I had just recently where I, if I look back at, it sounds so silly, but if I look back at some of the things that I enjoy the most about my work, it's been when I go into organizations and have to do projects where it's like, hey, go and do stakeholder interviews and go and interview like these 20 people across the organization or um, do one-on-one -on -one interviews with a bunch of consumers. I love that. I love talking to people and just being curious and also seeking to understand and being empathetic. And so that activity I thought I would enjoy. Um, and, and I'm definitely, that's playing out. It's, I, I really enjoy being in conversation with people. And you have recently started to t put your toe into video too, which is, uh, which I know is probably the most uncomfortable thing for most people to do when they finally make that leap. Talk about why you're trying to experiment with that, or you are experimenting with that and what that's felt like. Yes. Yes. My YouTube channel just went live. So that's very woo -hoo, exciting. Woo -hoo. Yes. <laughs> and you know, this is why I did it. And partly based off of your advice, Philip, not surprisingly, I just wanted to give people absorb information differently. So just to give an example, my husband has not probably read any of my content that's in written word. However, he is listening to every episode of my podcast. Okay. So it's just to say, it's not that he doesn't love me. It's just, he's not going to go read all that stuff. Right. But he will listen to my podcast. It's the same with video. Some people are going to want to engage and watch a video. Some people are going to want to listen to something and listen to the sound. The other reason I did video, because we'll see how, you know, consistently, I don't know if that I'm going to be as consistent as you and building like, and have, you know, how many do you have probably over 400 videos now? Like we'll see how many I end up doing, but I thought it was important, especially for, for the kind of work I want to do with people that they have an opportunity to engage with me or see me mm -hmm. and learn a little bit more about me without having to have a one-to-one -one interaction uh, you know, so it's both from a benefit of the end user, right? But it's also for the benefit of me, you know, you can only take so many phone calls and kind of like connect with people. And so if people can kind of, I don't always like the funnel term of, of marketing, but it's a reality of like, you get people into your funnel, right? But if people can both get free content, right? Get add value for them, have them get some insights, but also get a sense of who I am. So it both saves them time. Like, hey, if I'm not the right fit for you, totally fine. But if I am the right fit, great. Then go ahead and take the next step and reach out to me on my website. So my hope is that, again, it gives um, people a different way of absorbing or getting my content so that they, if they don't feel like reading or if they don't feel like listening to podcasts, they can listen to some of the videos uh, as well as that pre kind of selling or get, having people get a sense of who I am before they actually have a one-to-one -one conversation. I think that that's a really, really important point to highlight for the people listening is that when you start to build that personal brand, that it's not just about, well, it is about helping people and adding value to people's lives, your audience's lives. But when you look at it in terms of content marketing for yourself, what you're doing is you're putting a voice, you know, a, a, an audible voice or a, a visible presence to you, who you are. And so when potential clients come across it, they get to know you before they actually talk to you. And I found that to be a massive benefit in terms of business development because the people who come to me usually already kind of trust me. And that cuts out a whole 20 minutes of the conversation at the beginning in that discovery or qualification call where you're trying to establish, you know, some credibility. Um, and so I, I, I'm really glad you brought that up. And I think that that's a very, very important point to highlight for people in terms of the value of doing content, that it's not just about delivering the value and, you know, getting publicity, but it's about 
letting your audience get to know you at a much different level. So when they do come in contact with you, they already feel like you know you. I, they know you. I think that's great. When when you are when you're looking at you know, you're fairly new, fairly new to career coaching or executive coaching, and there have been huge arcs and changes in in the employment landscape, certainly within the COVID era of the last year, um, what do you see as as trends or important aspects of the career landscape right now that you would bring to the table as an executive coach to the people that you're working with? Something that they should be paying attention to. Well, I mean, I think that... I'm going to go back a little, maybe I'll, I'll just speak about what I'm hearing about from people. And I think that this is just so real. And because look, on the one hand, you could say, you know, hey, the, the economy is rough and certain parts of the economy have really gotten hit hard and the marketplace and, and the career landscape are searching for a job is difficult. And, and yet, you know, I, I had somebody on my podcast recently, Lisa Lewis Miller, who was saying, you know, and yet there's opportunity out there, right? Like they're definitely, you may have to shift, you may have to focus, refocus in terms of where those opportunities are in the marketplace. Um, so don't, don't give up hope. You know, um, I will say to that point, I think a big piece of kind of, thinking about one's career or looking for a job specifically say, and I, I kind of, I focus more on the upfront. There's a lot of work you need to do before you even get to a job if you're looking to do transition. And, um, but I think once you do get to that point of looking for a job, it is a lot of storytelling, right? Mm. And it's getting comfortable about with like, how do you tell your story? Who, how do you want to present yourself? Um, and how are you positioning yourself for what is next? Um, so that's one thing that I would that I would think about in terms of the marketplace. The second thing I was going to bring up, and it does relate back to sustainable ambition, but I only say this because of the impact of of COVID and in the pandemic and the impact. Frankly, I know everyone's saying it's a she session, and I think that that's true. But I think this is impacting everyone, especially people with little children, with little kids at home. I was going to say with children at home, and just there i i still think that there is this um wait hold it i can i back up a second you said yes. she session C she session is that like a recession but with she yes yeah, so women have really been disproportionately impacted yeah, by the pandemic sure. right mm -hmm. and so there have been more women who have exited the workforce because of the pandemic mm. and because of the need to because they bear a, more of the brunt of the work at home um even though you know men think that they do 50 percent of the work there's data that says like it's really if you ask the women then it's really they're like mm, it's more like 25 percent of the yeah, work right, right. The and so it's not 50 50. Um, and there's plenty of data out there that will show, you know, that is shown for decades, like, look, women are still doing a disproportionate amount of the work at home. Um, and so as soon as like, when p kids had to go home, if you have children at home, women, that's, that's just, it's born a brunt. And so you've had a lot of women that have stepped back. And so there is a lot of dialogue right now around this point of, hey, we, we're in this she session, like, how are we going to get as we start to come out of this, how are we going to get women back into the workforce? And so there's been a lot of dialogue around, hey, women were taking a step forward and now it's kind of like impacting um, women in this regard because they've stepped out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, so certainly the, the pandemic has had that impact. And I think this gets to the, the other point that I was going to make. So it's good that you emphasized it because we're all stretched right? The number of people that I talk to now too, who are like, oh my gosh, it's even worse during the pandemic in terms of, because every meeting has to be on Zoom or there can't just be this five minute, like quick touch base. It's a 30 minute call. And it's a, you know, so people just aren't getting downtime. And, you know, this whole really trying to find um, more work-life integration and, and space for people to kind of um, frankly, operate better overall, you know, because it, it's just people are overwhelmed. 
I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right? And so um, there, there isn't um, enough space in our, in our work environments for people to really achieve the sustainable ambition that I'm talking about. And I think mm. to me, there's gonna be a really interesting, uh, and I need to do some more thinking around this, but like as we start to think about how we go back to a workplace where people are like, hey, not everyone's coming in five days a week. A lot of people are starting to talk about this, right? And I really think this is a moment in time when organizations have to truly rethink how work gets done. So if you think about some of these like distributed companies, um, like a base camp or some others where you know, they don't have a headquarters office, right? And people, well, some of these companies are tech companies where, you know, and they're very interesting how they build their cultures and how they do their work. It's, it's not going to work for every single company. It's great that it works for them. But I think companies are really going to have to rethink how they structure work within them to provide people with ways of working that, frankly, I almost kind of think this might be a push or a force, uh, a push to finally get professional workers to get that unlock of productivity that people have been like, why are we not seeing more productivity, you know, mm -hmm. based on kind of like during this technology revolution? And I'm like, it's because we partly have to rethink how we actually do work together within organizations. Yeah, I, I heard a podcast recently that was, um, it was on um, the New York Times, I think, and it was a guy recent, who wrote a book about that, that productivity gap and how apps, essentially communication apps like Slack have eaten up all of our time, that it's this constant flow of chaos and, and our ability to um, create a staged approach to our work has turned into kind of an all on all the time kind of approach. And that that is what has eaten up our productivity because we aren't built for that kind of multitasking and we're being constantly pulled in 10 million directions. I mean, I don't know about you, but since the pandemic is like, I abhor email now. I mean, I run my whole business on email, but I like dread opening my email or keeping up with it. Literally just keeping up with it is really hard. Do you have any, um, you know, now that you're moving into this kind of ex level of expertise within a, within you know a career coaching and and sustainable professions, um, are there any suggestions that you have for people in this period of time where they're feeling overwhelmed? Are there any tools or techniques that you're using that are kind of keeping your head above water? It's a good question. So on my website, I talk about like in uh, one of my, there's, so there's three pillars of sustainable ambition. The first is right success. The second is right aspiration. And then the third is right effort. So how do you kind of focus your energy and your time so your work doesn't unintentionally take over your life, right? And I will admit, even for me, this is the hardest pillar, right? It's, and I think that this is a constant thing that somebody has to work on. And um, I kind of talk about this in the sense of like, I don't really believe in work-life balance because you're never in balance. You're never static, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're kind of constantly having to uh, adjust and evolve as well as there's going to be times in your life where you might be like, look, I'm all in on this particular project. And so I'm not going to be in balance and I'm going to structure my life in a way where I'm going to allow for that to happen. Um, so I, I talk about it's more important to build work life resilience, mm -hmm. right? Like how do you build resiliency so you can actually kind of handle the different things that come at you in your life? Um, then within right effort, I talk about their seven P's and uh, forgive me because I probably I can't rattle them all off right now. But there's have to work there's on seven, that, Kathy, seven Yeah, P's. yeah. Seven P's, um, not four, not three, but seven. Um, and actually there's nine, but I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 cla I clap some um, down to seven. Um, but I think, but, but I, I just suggest going to the website and kind of reading about the seven, because I think there's different elements um, such as, well, how do you bring in more productivity or how do you um, bring in pauses? So let me let me just note, because we've been talking, we talked about sabbatical earlier. We talked, let's talk about the importance of pauses. Mm. And, um, you know, I don't think that, that pauses have to be these protracted long pauses, right? Like what if you just took at the top of every hour, one minute 
to literally take five to 10 deep breaths, however long that takes you to do that, right? To like slow down, calm your nervous system. You know, look, Philip's starting to close his eyes and want to take a deep breath. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. (laughs) Right? Just to slow down and to, and to pause. Um, that can be really powerful to build your work-life resilience as you're going through these kind of crazy times. Um, the other thing, one other thing that I'll just mention instead of like going down the laundry list, I, I mentioned this, uh, this gentleman a lot um, lately, but Dr. Rick Hansen is, is somebody, he's a psych, psychologist who's written a book called Resilience. I took a class with him a couple of years ago. And one, he's, he's kind of rooted in um, mindfulness in, in some of his techniques as well as neuroscience. Um, and one of the things he really talks about around um, building resilience is this idea of have an experience and then embed it, really Mm. have it get into your body and experience it deeply. Because in doing that, it it creates these stores in a way that helps build your resilience. So you ask like, well, what am I doing even during this time of the pandemic? Well, if I'm feeling a little anxious or I'm feeling like I need a break, like I really pay attention, you know, to what I am needing in the moment. And, you know, I am lucky enough to live near Golden Gate Park. It is my second uh, happiest place on earth uh, after Central Park. And I, you know, I'm in there almost every day going for a walk. But when I go for a walk, I am taking in the blue sky. I am really, really absorbing it. Even this morning, I was lucky enough to take a break and go into the botanical garden. And it's just in bloom and it's beautiful. And I can just, really pause to take it in and absorb that. Um, Those small things, they don't have to be huge. They don't have to be big, but even just taking those small moments to kind of fill yourself up uh, during this time of kind of craziness can help you build some resiliency to kind of give you some stores to carry you forward during this time. I love that. That is awesome. And I I was, I was doing it right when you were describing it. (laughs) Um, I think that's a really interesting point because as you were talking, I was thinking about sleep. And when you sleep, your brain and part of dreaming is your brain is taking all of your experiences in that day and it's sorting through them and deciding which ones it's going to embed into memory and which ones it's are unimportant and it's going to get rid of. So it kind of it does this sorting kind of cleaning up housekeeping process. And to a certain extent, that's kind of what you're talking about, right, which is taking a moment and really experiencing whatever the experience was and deciding on how you're going to embed that or if you're going to embed that, right? Yeah, and those experiences, they can really pay off in dividends. So like take, for example, even again, was lucky enough to take seven and a half months sabbatical and during that time, lucky enough to to travel during part of it. But I will tell you that trip fills me up to this day. You know, I can just go back to an experience on that trip and it will bring me instant joy. I'm feeling it right now, even as I sit here. And so being it, it it reminds you about this whole importance of presence, right? And being present to your experiences, you know, that you're having really pay attention. I mean, Mm -hmm. because they you can call on them in the future to really help fill you up. I love it. This has been an amazing conversation. I always end my interviews with one question, and that is, do you have a personal mantra or some sort of manifesto that you try to live your life by? Yeah, this is another one where uh, it came to me recently or over the last year, and I realize I've been living this for a long time. And it was inspired by something that Marie Forleo actually shared. And I don't remember where, if it was written or if it was in a podcast or what, but she said something like, choose growth and learning over comfort and certainty. Mm. And so what the reason why this really spoke to me, and it spoke to me in the moment, because this quote actually speaks to two of my core values. I really value stability. Okay, so I want comfort and certainty. (laughs) And yet another huge value for me is growth and learning. It is so important to me. And this actually helped me realize like, oh, Kathy, why did you take yourself from the West Coast 
and fly to the East Coast to a school by yourself on a plane with four suitcases without ever having visited the school and like go there to school. And it's because I really wanted to go to the East Coast for school. I really wanted to have a different experience. And that's, you know, what I could afford, right? Like my parents can afford to like fly me and take me. So I just went off and, <laughs> and did it. Moving to New York City by myself, like I just went and I did it. I chose that growth and learning over that comfort and that certainty. Mm. And I was kind of experiencing that even last year. And what was really helpful about this model for me was to recognize in the moment, like, hey, you're going to, if you had a choice between this path that's going to give you comfort and certainty, do you want that? Or do you want the path that actually is going to give you the growth and learning? And so it helped me prioritize that one, um, that, that path. And I'll just close with this because it was, uh, this was a quote that I just came across recently from M. Somerset Mom, which who said, only a mediocre person is always at his best. Okay, so only a mediocre person is always his best. The reason I bring this up is, again, when you are feeling uncomfortable and on a growth curve, right, it's because you're you're reaching for something more, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not staying static. So it's like, it's just to say, I really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my motto out there to others, just this choice of choose growth, choose that growth mindset that Carol Dredd talk, talks about, challenge yourself and embrace, just as you say, Philip, I'm going to bring yours in here, dare to suck, yeah. right? Like dare to be on that learning curve um, because there's so much richness in that growth and learning. Well, if you are looking to grow and learn and possibly pivot or look at your career in a new way, I encourage you to contact Kathy Onetto. She is pro an ex exceptional executive coach and has an amazing insight into careers. And so, Kathy, where is the best place for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can reach me at sustainableambition.com. That's my website. And uh, I have a ton of resources there. If you go to sustainableambition.com slash resources, you can sign up uh, for my newsletter and get access to those resources. And then check out my podcast on, you know, it's on Apple, Google, Spotify, all the usual places. Um, and you can also find me on YouTube now. And the too. name of your podcast is Sustainable Ambition? The the Sustainable Ambition Podcast, yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for speaking to us, Kathy. It was really great having you on the show. Thanks for having me, Philip. This has been great.